Okay, hear me out. Chaotic has the best card lore out of any trading card game. Now, all my Yu-Gi-Oh! Pokemon fans and maybe even my Magic Boys are probably like, Chaotic? The TV show with the janky animation style that died in like 2012? Yup, that game has the best lore, and I'm gonna explain why. The beauty of Chaotic is that while it did have a TV show affiliated with it, like Yu-Gi-Oh! did, and it did have card text at the bottom of several of the cards, like Magic, the thing that made Chaotic so special is that players actually got to experience the plot of the game through the game's own mechanics. Here's a 30 second rundown of the game. You have two armies fighting against each other, armies of 1, 3, 6, or 10, depending on how you're feeling on any given day. You and your opponent take turns fighting little one-on-one -on -one battles against each other's creatures that are directly adjacent to each other on this big battle board. Only one creature can survive each battle, so rinse and repeat until one of you runs out of creatures, and the winner is the player who successfully takes out the opposing player's army. You've also got item cards, magic cards, locations, and a bunch of other stuff you don't really need to know for this video in specific. Here's the one thing you do need to know though, and that's the idea of tribes. Part 1, Dawn of Param. The first rule set of Chaotic was the Dawn of Param rule set, which had four different types of creatures that you could choose from. The Paragon-like Overworlders, the rather nefarious Underworlders, the Invisible Lizard-like Mepedians, and the Danians with their swarm-like insect-inspired designs. On the show and in the in-card lore, they all interact with one another in a place called Param. Each of the aforementioned archetypes play entirely differently, and while you could mix and match different races, the archetypes tended to work at their best when you had most of the army composed of the same tribe. Danians are probably the best example of this, with a good chunk of their strategies coming from a creature activating the hive as a special ability, and all other creatures being able to benefit from their hive abilities when the hive is active. They also have the Mandiblore sub-archetype, where you had little worker Mandiblores who would go off and die on the front lines only to power up the stronger leader bugs at the back of your army later on. The overall lore of the Dawn of Param arc of this series is pretty simple. Kaor, the lord of the underworld, wants more power, red man bad, and Maxor is like, nah, blue man good. <laughs> Not too many subversions of the archetypical horde versus alliance dynamic that you'd see in something like World of Warcraft. The Mepedians are largely allied with the Overworlders, with some exceptions, and the Danians are largely allied with the Underworlders, again with some exceptions. The lore of the card game was definitely one of the selling points of the game, but it wasn't anything to ride home about. But then, the Marillion Invasion happened, and everything changed. Part 2 Invasion! I don't know why I'm doing that voice. I don't know, maybe it's... Maybe someone will find that funny. When fans of Chaotic, at least fans of the trading card game, think of the golden age of the card game, what comes to mind is usually the second wave of cards, which not only shaped the way that the game was played, but also the relationships that players had with the very creatures that they were using. Back in the earlier Dawn of Param series, there were subtle hints to a setup involving dark forces that had been locked away long ago, a dark secret that some people wanted uncovered. In this second series, you learn what that secret was, and in reality, the whole time, it was an ancient tribe of Lovecraftian horrors that were trapped away long ago, a tribe with the ability to brainwash other creatures and manipulate water. This fifth tribe, called the Marillions, had a number of tribe-specific archetypes, but the one that changed the game forever was that brainwashing mechanic. This made it so that you could have an army of Marillions, but you could also combine different classes, so you could actually thrive off of tribe diversity. Because brainwashing cards use special brainwashing text, it usually worked better pairing Marillions with a variety of different clans, so you could actually have Marillions, Mepedians, and Underworlders all in the same army. What's worse is that unlike the Dawn of Param part of the series, this part of the series seemed to have tremendous implications of lasting consequences in the card lore. You see, as you played the game and watched the accompanying show, you got used to certain characters and relationships in the world of Param. The Underworld, for example, has this weird little rabbit dude called Hearing who would help some of the characters out if they paid him. Dractal scales. Ew. He's more of a jovial character than some of the other Underworld monstrosities, so he's a welcome addition to the world, letting the viewer know that Underworld culture is a little more complex than, hey, they're bad guys. Seeing these iconic characters, this cute little bunny creature, getting turned into this, ugh, it's honestly disturbing. It's like watching Pikachu get morphed into some grotesque being against its will. But wait, Manic, you say skeptically. I get that these Cthulhu dudes are like super powerful, but what if I'm not playing a Marillion deck? What if my opponent isn't playing that kind of deck either? Can't I just play the old version of hearing and avoid this lore altogether? I can just play the cute version of the card. Well, skeptical viewer, reprints of the older cards and not only have brainwashed texts that work best with Marillions, but also a standard text that works best with traditional armies. Basically, you're getting an upgraded version of the older monster. Let's look at an example. 
Kaibon is an older card released in the very first set of booster packs found in the game. Two booster packs into the Marillion Invasion set, and there's been a re-release of Kaibon, Kaibon the Renegade, who has better stats all around, and the Wind Element, which works better for deck synergy. Furthermore, when you look at this guy, it's pretty obvious that he has a thing for weapons, so they gave him an ability that actually more closely matches his personality. You can still technically play the older version of Kaibon, but the reprinted version is the one that you're going to use if you want to win, meaning that even if you're playing a raw Underworld exclusive deck, you're still forced to see that the version of Kaibon that you're playing with has already been consumed by the Marillions. Because this game heavily incentivizes you to use newer versions of the card to be able to keep up with your competition, you're going to see the effects of the Marillion Invasion as you play the game, no matter which decks you use. This gets particularly gnarly when you've become somewhat attached to the creatures throughout. The brainwashed creatures slowly start to crowd the metagame, and with each new release, there's this encroaching threat of the Marillion Invasion that gets just a little bit realer for the player base. Bit by bit. Until... Part 3, we're in like really deep doo-doo, man. By the third pack in the Marillion Invasion series, you've got fan favorites like Magmon, Atacat, Relim, Raran, Nothlax, and even the wise old sage Tartaric, or he's pronounced Tartarek apparently in the anime, but whatever. Oh, did I just call it an anime? Oh lord, I'm losing all my subs, aren't I? Anyway, all of these guys have been brainwashed. Felfor, the guy who opened the gates, straight up turns out to be a tentacle monster the whole time, so that's a fun little twist. In real life, it was always a genuinely tense moment to open up a booster pack, because you were never really sure if one of your favorites from the world of Param had been brainwashed by a giant Cthulhu monster. As a result, one such brainwashed creature was so utterly jarring to see that my friends and I actually audibly gasped when we opened him up in a card pack one day. Okay, so this is Lord Von Blut. He's a powerful winged demon who's always vying for Kaor's crown. He's one of the many antagonists of the series, and causes lots of trouble for the main characters on the show. Kaor and Lord Von Blut are essentially always at each other's throats, which is super cool to watch because they're basically the two strongest underworlders. Well, during the third set release during the Marillion Invasion, this card was released. Lord Von Blut, Servant of Ani. Y yes, it's pronounced Ani. <laughs> Ah, it's ruining the intensity of this moment, but yeah, it's a stupid spelling. This character, whose entire personality is built off of the fact that he can't stand the idea of serving Kaor, to the point where he is constantly challenging Kaor and risking his own life, is now not only brainwashed, but he has also been dubbed Servant of Ani. This not only acts as a wake-up call for players, now understanding that major characters can become brainwashed, but also for the in-game tribe leaders, who decide that the only way to win this war is to stop fighting amongst each other and finally team up. Now here's the fun thing, you don't need to have seen the TV show to know that any of this is happening. As a matter of fact, the TV show varies in quality. Sometimes it's really good and interesting, and other times it kinda just short sells itself on certain elements of the plot. It can be worth checking out for nostalgia's sake, and even though the season 2 finale is utter garbage, honestly it could still be worth your time. That being said, the beauty of everything that I'm telling you about is that you got to experience this as you were playing the game, and that is pretty special. While most tribe abilities used to function best with homogenous team building, the cards released during the Turn of the Tide and Forged Unity sets heavily emphasized creating teams that combine the different strengths of different tribes together within the same army. One such example is the Legendary General archetype, who benefited from having as many different OG races as possible in order to maximize their strength. By the way, when I'm referring to OG races, I'm referring to Overworlders, Underworlders, Mepedians, and Danians. The most popular example of this emphasis on unity comes from the Ivena Nivena lore, which pits these two sisters, one Overworlder and one Underworlder, at odds with each other. The two cards were also given the loyal restriction upon their initial printing, meaning that they literally couldn't take part in mixed decks. You had to have a monochromatic team if you wanted to play them. Ivena had to belong on an Overworld team, and Nivena had to belong on an Underworld team. But here's what they looked like in Forged Unity. When Forge Unity came along, if Ivena and Nivena are your last two creatures, Ivena literally gains the ability to come over and save her sister from combat, and Nivena, the mage, gets the ability to cast her magic at a cheaper cost when only she and her sister are around. This Ivena Nivena example just goes to show how you can generate a narrative in a card game through mechanics, not just card lore. What started out as two sisters at odds with one another has now changed into a situation where they realize that they're actually the strongest when they're together. What's cool is that over the course of actually playing this game, you actually get to see different creatures coming to terms with the fact that they have to be unified in order to beat this massive alien invasion. 
So here's a fun little design question for you. You're a game designer that still wants some people to be able to use their own individual tribes in combat while still reinforcing the theme of international unity in the game. What do you do? Well, the Danish boys at Chaotic HQ came up with two different solutions to this problem. The first is to straight up have Marillion deniers, <laughs> or stooges who foolishly think that they can take the Marillions all on their own. Ruban, for example, has a text that reads, You cowards, we don't need Maxor's help, we can defeat the Marillions on our own. Given the way that the issue eventually gets resolved, it's clear that this line of reasoning is meant to be seen as incredibly foolish, with someone stubbornly clinging to old rivalries and failing to see the bigger picture. The second thing that you can do is while you still have creatures who are loyal to their factions, they're doing so in order to unify their parties in order to join with other tribes. You've got two really good examples here, Maxor's new and improved version, for example, which is in fact loyal, so it's an overworld homogenous card, still has the text, I don't just fight for the overworld, I fight for all of Param. Same with another popular character, Interest, whose new text reads, despite our differences, since the Kothika flows through each of us, we are all united. Again, these characters are overworld exclusive, you cannot use them in mixed decks. However, they clearly have unifying contexts that let you know that even though they're only fighting with overworlders now, they're fighting with the rest of the original tribes to save the world from this impending aquatic force. Part 4, maybe there's like an allegory here. Ultimately, Chaotic uses its gameplay not only to generate a narrative, but also to enforce the idea that international cooperation is the most effective means of overcoming huge global threats. The OG tribes ultimately defeat the Marillions, and while the final set in the series kinda goes back and forth a bit on who's on whose team, it's obvious to the player base that Param is at its best when its different tribes strive for unity. If you think everything I've said here is a bit of a stretch, well then hear this. You can see this emphasis on collaboration in the second season of the show as well. Before the Marillion invasion even begins, there's this parable about Rasnus, an overworld ambassador to the Danians who seeks peace between tribes. He's ultimately betrayed, which adds an extra sting to the game theory nature of international politics, especially when you learn that he taught Maxor how to be kind to other races. You also see it in the player world with the main characters in episode 3 when this happens. Don't worry, you still have five creatures left, and remember your hive ability. Danian are stronger when they work together. Just hang in there. So here, this kid's dad not only needs to learn to make his creatures work well together, but he also needs to learn to work together with his son instead of berating him. When the Marillion invasion first happens in the lore, some people deny that it's happening altogether. Others think that their individual nations can solve the problem on their own. But there is strength in unity. And only in a final battle where each of the original four tribes unite by putting their best fighters forward, can they defeat the rising tide of the Marillion invasion? Again, definitely no allegory here, folks. Totally in my imagination. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, then gently click that like button and gently caress the subscribe button too while you're at it. That subscribe button works so hard all day and he gets no love. I, I, I feel like we should just give him a gentle caress today just to, just to show our support for the subscribe button. Not for me. So my two YouTuber recommendations for this week's video are going to be Negative Legend and Sarah Z. Negative Legend is a really interesting, more small-scale YouTube channel. He's had some videos go kind of viral, um, but essentially he is sort of a nostalgia-based YouTube channel that kind of goes over the history of things that like you might remember from your childhood, um, but have kind of wondered like what's happened to them. So he's got this really interesting video on Chaotic, go figure, and he's also got a video that I really liked on the Winx Club randomly. <laughs> I used to, uh, when I was growing up I had like Fox Kids uh, that I'd wake up to in the morning so I was like oh what is this Winx show and I was like oh the show isn't very good and largely doesn't appeal to me um, but yeah he's one of the few people that seems to like Chaotic as much as I do as a matter of fact he said that if Chaotic was still a game that was alive he would dedicate his entire channel to it so go check out Negative Legend if you're interested in that kind of content. Uh, otherwise, there's Sarah Z. Sarah Z is a really interesting voice in the YouTube essay sphere. I feel like her type of video essay is more sociologically driven than humanities driven, if that makes any sense. It's not like she's doing peer-reviewed stuff or anything, but I feel like she's a cultural critic and less so of an art critic, which I find to be interesting. Like, or you take your Lindsay Ellis's, for example, and they're, they're very much focused on, like, you know, 
um, the film itself or, you know, the implications of that film. But I feel like Sarah Z goes off in like interesting different directions. Like she, I made a video about like branding and how like different brands create personalities uh, on Twitter and stuff and how uh, it's sort of become this oversaturated market. And I thought that was really cool. She's also got another video on um, uh, the YouTube video debate format where like oh, owning people like Ben Shapiro wrecks this guy and how that format is kind of garbage and how it's not conducive to actual debate and how it doesn't actually achieve anything. So if you haven't seen those two channels, check them out. This has been The Manic Pineapple. Goodbye!